all of Dave's old meds. As soon as he said he was suicidal, we took him to the hospital and put them all in there. So I didn't know what else to do. I mean, if he really wanted to commit suicide, there's nothing I could do about it, but I wasn't going to make it easy. I think that I swallowed that shit for, you know, years and years. Any questions or comments from the committee? This time we'd like to call David Cope. My name is Lieutenant Commander David Cope of the United States Navy. I'm a 2007 graduate of the Naval Academy at Annapolis and a 2012 graduate of MIT with dual master's degrees in mechanical engineering and naval architecture. At 32, I'm a disabled veteran, soon to be medically retired from the Navy due to chronic health conditions resulting from the use of the benzodiazepine Ativan as prescribed over several years. The indisputable reality of short-term usefulness and long-term risk demands patients receive explicit informed consent prior to benzodiazepine prescription. I cannot roll back the clock. I will not regain my career as a naval officer. I'm not affiliated with any organization. The Dave that I fell in love with was, um, he had so much energy. He was the happiest person I'd ever met. He would go sailing, biking, or hiking, and he was kind and he was patient. I mean, we talked for hours on end about all kinds of things, and I miss, I miss that a lot. I was a waitress in New York City. Pretty normal girl doing normal things, nothing exceptional, nothing not exceptional, just normal. My mind was clear, I was happy. The only little issue I had was I couldn't sleep. I'd get out at two, three in the morning, so I knew that my sleep issues were related to working nighttime. So I went to my doctor, just my regular doctor, I would see him maybe twice a year. Um, and I asked him for something for sleep. And he would always say to me, I'll never forget. He always hit me on my knee. Just go to sleep. You're too young to not be able to sleep. Just go to sleep. I don't write prescriptions for sleeping pills. If you want that, you have to get it from a psychiatrist. I then said, yeah, sure, why not? He gave me a referral. And I took the referral and I called a bunch of psychiatrists and this one doctor in Brooklyn said, yeah, we're seeing patients, come on in. He gave me a prescription for lorazepam. He told me to take two in the day and two at night. I then said, why would I need to take a sleeping pill during the day? I don't want to sleep during the day. And he said, that is how it works. I said, okay. That's me, right before I was putting on Clonip in the first time. I just got back from Iraq. That's all my brothers and sisters. And this sister is a waitress now. I used to drive her daughter to school, and I just had, like, the worst thoughts. Like, the school was going to blow up, all the kids would be dead. And then, like, that thought created adrenaline. So then when the adrenaline kicked, I was like, oh, my God, am I going to be the one that does it? And then it's like, yeah, Angie, you're going to kill these kids. And then I'm like... I'm like sitting here looking at my niece, like I can't, and the thoughts are so bad that like your like teeth chatter. Like, oh my God, I'm capable of that. Are you kidding me? And then you get horrified because like, you're like, why am I thinking this stuff? This is not like me. I don't want to do anything to anybody's kids. I love my niece. This doesn't make sense. Why am I thinking this? I don't know. It's like chemical mental torture. I was never like this. That's the scariest part because I don't know, is this my normal, like, did Effexor do this to me? Did Cymbalta do this to me? Did Geodon, Abilify? Which one? Which one did it?
was a restless child. I was always thinking ahead, thinking what comes next. My mom, yeah, I think she would call me the, the worrier of the house. I worried about the unknown, you know, things that weren't in my control and I would overthink them. My anxiety led me to be very successful academically. I got accepted into the Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. After Annapolis, I did a few years on a destroyer based out of Mayport, Florida. And then when you're at sea, you're training to be the guy directing the ship, where to navigate, where to go. It's great fun, but it's also extremely high stress. But I loved it. I was pre-selected for satellite systems engineering. Part of that was going to grad school. When I got the acceptance letter from MIT, it was one of those moments where you're just like, this is not happening, you know, it must be a mistake. But then, you know, stars have aligned and I was really happy. Fall semester went off, you know, without a hitch. I had started a romantic relationship earlier that summer. The early spring is when things started to uh, fall apart. Uh, my romantic relationship kind of uh, took a turn, you know, became toxic. You know, I was in distress. I was overwhelmed. We were taking upwards of four to five graduate level courses a semester. And so I sought out care from the mental health clinic at MIT, the campus clinic. They diagnosed me with general anxiety disorder. The presented solution to my problems was a prescription for uh, the benzodiazepine Ativan, which I'd never previously known about or taken, um, and Zoloft. They work as advertised. I mean, it's, it's very immediate effect. It's very calming. And all along the way, I was noticing changes. And I can remember distinctly the first time I was concerned about it. I was a teacher's assistant for a small group of students that was doing ship design, and I was running them through a program that I had used extensively for the last several years. And I just got to a point where like, I just, there was just a cognitive block. There was just a wall, just a block. Like I didn't know where to go next. And I said, doc, this really isn't working. You know, I need something out like what else could help me? Um, and the solution was diagnose me with ADHD, put me on amphetamine. And from that point on, it's about six to eight months beyond that, everything was grand. Dave told me probably on our third or fourth date that he was on medication for depression and um, ADHD. I have ADHD myself um, and take medication for that. I had issues with depression and sought out help and medication and counseling. and It's kind of fairly normal now. I met the girl of my dreams. I got engaged during that period. Work was great, loved it. You know, back to my normal, what I thought was my normal self. Somewhere in the eight month time range, I started having, I started noticing emotional flatness, some sexual dysfunction, difficulty remembering what street we lived on. That whole period is just a blur. Like I was a zombie, had this big wedding planned. I remember talking to my mom prior to it. I was, mom, I, I just, I feel nothing. I feel emotionally void of anything. And that's when I went to the psychiatrist and said, you know, this is this stuff isn't for me. You know, uh, I need to get off it. I think the drug is my problem. That that's really when shit hit the fan. Birth year or death year? This long walk like, today will help. I will. I've always been very close with my parents, even when I was a child. I love school. I like to be with my friends a lot. I feel very comforted just being around other people. When I was 11 years old, I moved from Nashville to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We moved a lot for my parents' various jobs, which is very hard in terms of keeping like lifelong friends. I would oftentimes just like sit in my room and listen to music and just like honestly just kind of mope, mope around. I started having a lot of anxiety about school and I was so anxious I got these stomach aches where I didn't want to eat. I wouldn't eat breakfast because I had a stomach ache. I wouldn't eat much lunch because I had a stomach ache. I noticed how that she'd gotten kind of thin. I just kind of blurted out, you know, do you think you might be anorexic? She went and got on the scale and she said, you know, I think I've lost 20 pounds. And so I just totally freaked out. And 
got an appointment the same day. And then toward the end, the therapist asked me to come into the room. She said, I think what would really be best to kickstart this treatment is for her to get on antidepressants. Wait a second, we came here uh, for the talk therapy, right? We didn't come here to kickstart it with medication. That's the whole point of going to a therapist, I thought. Rebecca was prescribed Zoloft um, for the first medication. She said it didn't really make a difference. Uh, she didn't feel any better. But she also didn't really feel any worse at that time. Um, so when we saw her um, doctor again, the doctor switched her to Prozac. Shortly after, I had a business trip and I got a phone call from Rebecca and she said, you know, I've been, I've been seeing this little girl. And I'm like, what do you mean you've been seeing a little girl? Yeah, like, like she, you know, she's not really there, but like I can see her and I named her Alice. Like I genuinely thought that there were people here in the room that weren't there that people could also see. But, but they were very real for me. Like in my head, I knew I knew that they weren't there, but they were there and I couldn't explain that away. And I said to Rebecca, well, does it scare you? And she's like, no, not really. Alice doesn't seem to do much. You know, so the, the, it was a benign hallucination at that time. At that time. Uh, and so we were alarmed, but we, we didn't want to overreact either. One of the, the people that I had the real, not real people that I had been seeing um, sort of interacted with me. That was always what kind of kept me in check with reality. They're not saying anything, they're not doing anything, they can't touch you, they're not there, it's fine. So I went into my parents' room, just like, sh yeah, shaking, frightened, crying, and I told, I told them what had just happened. She came into our bedroom uh, late at night, and um, she was shaking, she said, you know, the, halluc the hallucination touched me and asked me to come into the kitchen so I could hurt myself. And they said, you know, enough of this. She needs, she needs help. I didn't even know people could have sleep issues because mm -hmm. I was sleeping normal all my mm -hmm. life, so it's mm -hmm. not something I thought about. So, but I had a feeling it was my job. I just didn't think I could quit my job. I thought I could get help for it. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. how come I went to a psychiatrist. And he prescribed me this drug, lorazepam. I took it for six years. And you, wait, you took lorazepam for six years? Six and, a, six and a half years. Unfortunately, that's the problem that most pharmacists see with lorazepam. Uh, lorazepam, again, if, they, if the doctor takes a time out, to read the, the package insert, it clearly states... Are they not reading? That I don't know. I can only <laughs> tell you what I read. The package insert from the manufacturer clearly states that lorazepam is only for short-term use, uh, maybe two to four weeks. The lorazepam hasn't been studied for long-term therapy. I asked him, I said, can I take this drug? Are you sure it's not dangerous? You sure I can stop when I want? And he said, yes, yes, yes. And it did help me to sleep. I slept like a rock. The use of benzodiazepine has increased tremendously over the years. Since they've been around for such a long time, a lot of doctors have forgotten about the side effects and the possible dangers of these medications. None of them were ever meant for long-term use, but everybody knows somebody uh, who's been taking benzodiazepine for years. I started thinking like, okay, when did this start? How did this start? What led up to like me falling apart? Like I was the go-to person in my unit always. If they needed a job done and they needed it done right, they would ask me. I was physically fit, knew my job. I got promoted to sergeant. After work, I was like a lot of fun. I liked to travel, go to the beach, spontaneous. I was just like the happy person, like the happy-go-lucky friend. Like, hey, let's go shopping. Let's go to a bakery. Let's, you know, never had a second thought about anything crazy. That's who I was before this. 
So when the war started, I think most of it was stressful situations every day, like being shot at on convoys, just driving around in dangerous areas of Baghdad. Your head was like constantly like scanning for something dangerous. All the soldiers in my unit would say, I have a letter for my mom, it's in my pocket of my flak jacket. Or I have a letter to my dad, it's in my helmet. So if I die, please give it to my parents. And then I said, I'm not writing a fucking letter because I'm not gonna die in this, sorry. Like I'm gonna be a strong sergeant. I don't take no shit. That's just the way I was. But like the first two months I was in Baghdad, like I'm really, really sick. I had nosebleeds, fainting, dizziness. I lost like 40 pounds. So they medevaced me out of Iraq. Then my convoy got hit the day after I got medevaced. And so I saw the kid come back in and he was one of my soldiers and I felt horrible. And like that was the day that I saw psychiatry with the arrow mm -hmm. and I walked straight there because mm -hmm. that's what you do. I don't know. And they put me on Clonovan. Right. That's how this all started. Right. They're trained while they're on active duty, very, very systematically, that if you come back and you have problems, you need to go to the doctor. A hundred years ago, if they had this kind of a trauma, would talk to their fellow soldiers, talk to their parents, talk to their friends, talk to their pastor, and instead they're going to their doctor and getting medicated. I saw the sign for psychiatry. I walked down the hall. I remember it was just like a really small office, and I was sitting in a chair, and I told it was a major, I remember that. And I said, um, sir, every time I hear a door slam, it sounds like a gunshot. I, my mind is racing, like I need help. And then he said, oh, just take this medicine. It'll make you feel better. And I just picked up the prescription and started taking it. And I think the clonopin was starting to make me worse, but they just kept telling me that's what PTSD is. You have PTSD now. And then I remember he looked at me and he said, we're gonna start the proceedings for medical retirement you are not able to be around soldiers and no weapons. And I remember feeling like, how was I like super soldier and now I'm disabled at 25? Are you kidding? There is a, a, a post-traumatic stress and it's a problem. So we would never argue with you that it's not a problem. It is a problem. It's a big problem. But for you, it's not a mental illness. Like I feel like I'm waking up from a nightmare. Mm -hmm. Like what the fuck just happened to my life? You lost years of your life. You lost your career. There's just so many things yeah. that, that are losses in here. That's part of the, the situation that we're in right now as a culture, is that if you run to the doctor and cry about this, they're gonna say, oh, you have major depression, and you're gonna stick you on the next pill, instead of saying, hey, you know what? Suffering is the only normal response. There's a grief process yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm that you have that. to go through. Yes. Wow. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. Actually, what I'll do is, for the military in here, there's my resume. This is, this is what my children love to point out to, I have daughters and they love to point out to their boyfriends, like don't mess with me because my mother's not gonna miss. I'm a board certified clinical psychologist. So I'm gonna talk to you about science. I'm gonna talk to you about reality. I'm gonna talk to you about the, the research. People come home from war and they're frequently grieving um, and suffering um, tremendously. But none of that's pathology, it's grief. One of the things that's happened in our culture is that normal has been confused by marketers of all kinds with, with comfortable, okay? So if you're in a normal state, you must also be in a comfortable state. And if you're uncomfortable in any way, there's something wrong. It's, you're abnormal. Not one thing in the DSM-5, this book, the Diagnostic and Statistics Manual, the fifth edition, the Bible of Psychiatry, not one thing in there is isolated by science. There's no physical findings. There's no PET scan, there's no MRI, there's no blood test. There's just behavior that has been described by psychiatry and labeled aberrant. It's outside of the normal, what we consider normal. And they set a cutoff and then they voted into this book. Okay, how did we decide that how long you could have acute stress disorder was three to 28 days? A committee sat around and said, what do you think? How many days should people be in acute stress? And they said, mm, I don't know. How about let's go with 28 days. Why 28 days? It's four weeks. It's four outpatient visits. It's a beautiful billing cutoff. It seemed right. All in favor? Bam. Those are the clinical criteria. The power that I had as a military psychologist to say, you are not normal. I could destroy your career. I can send you home. I can, I can label you with something that you can never overcome. My name's Alan Francis. I'm a psychiatrist. Uh, former chair of psychiatry at Duke University and was the chair of the DSM-4 task force, which established the definitions for the diagnoses of the various mental disorders. Normal's in danger. Um, the definitions used in psychiatry, and even more the way they're applied, have become so wide 
that um, a far too large percentage of the population would be defined as having a mental disorder. You know, now we have patients come in and if they're, you know, they're anxious or they can't sleep or they have some kind of physical pain, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, let's get rid of that. We have really vilified pain. And I'm talking emotional pain, physical pain. Like it has now become the responsibility of the doctor to eliminate all suffering at all costs. Some patients require the very closest in psychiatric and medical supervision, very, very tough problems. But most people presenting to a GP for anxiety have a short-term stressor that's making them feel terrible. Most of the symptoms will go away in most people within a few weeks or a month. We shouldn't confuse normal sadness and normal anxiety with mental disorder. And that line has been terribly blurred. There is a cultural context. And the context really goes back to the arrival of antibiotics in the late 1940s and then the polio vaccine. They really do change life. Bacterial infections are no longer a problem, and now we have this magic cure for polio. So now we believe in magic bullets. Pretty soon we're going to be having magic bullets for everything. What you find in psychiatry, if you trace its history, that is in the 1970s, American psychiatry was in competition with other therapists for talk therapy, counselors, social workers. What do they say to themselves? They say, we need to present ourselves as doctors, as medical doctors. We need to put on a white coat. They adopt a disease model for categorizing psychiatric disorder. We're going to say these are diseases of the brain, illnesses of the brain, that our drugs, therefore, treat the symptoms of those illnesses. It centers on this chemical imbalance theory of mental disorders. What I was taught in med school was that depression, for example, is a genetic chemical imbalance in the brain affecting serotonin and that it's corrected with a pill. And there is this understanding that if you're manifesting with depression, that this is you, it's who you're gonna be, it's like a destiny, and that implies taking medication often for life. It hasn't been possible to demonstrate that first you have a chemical imbalance and then because of that you become depressed or psychotic. But what we have shown is that the drugs create a chemical imbalance. Nobody has a clue what happens when you push this system somewhere. You have all sorts of reactions elsewhere. It's a very naive thought that a psychiatric disorder is based on one, one single thing chemically that went wrong and then we have a quick fix for that. It's totally naive. While the cause is unknown, depression may be related to an imbalance of natural chemicals between nerve cells in the brain. Prescription Zoloft works to correct this imbalance. When you know more about what's wrong, you can help make it right. In 1980, American Psychiatric Association adopted a disease model and began to tell that story to the American public. You know who was so happy with that story? The pharmaceutical industry. They were thrilled with this story because now they could see markets expanding, depression, anxiety, all these things that we used to think of as sort of normal fluctuations in, in human experience could now be seen as illnesses, therefore you could treat with drugs, and they said, wow. Is depression more than sadness? It's a tangle of multiple symptoms. It's basically reduced down to must be a chemical problem. And since it's a chemical problem, there's a pill to fix it. That has, of course, been a boon for the pharmaceutical industry, which now wants to diseaseify every single experience because they want to sell their pills to treat it. Binge eating disorder, or BED, isn't just overeating. It's a real medical condition. Certain chemicals in the brain may play a role. BED is also the most common eating disorder in U.S. adults.
I never really thought that the medication was a bad thing. I was like, yeah, if this is gonna make me feel better, awesome. Okay, if this other one's gonna make me feel better, awesome. Oh, if these four are gonna make me feel better, great, let's do it, I will try anything. There was never any notion that the medication was causing these symptoms. It was more like the, the disease was developing. The only warning she sort of gave, but she was very dismissive about it, was you might hear, uh, Mr. Green, that in some instances, uh, people who are on antidepressants might have suicidal thoughts, but this really isn't something you should be overly concerned about. She said kind of almost flippantly, like, oh, you might want to lock up your knives. So we went out and bought we did. a lockbox yeah. and put anything, you know, dangerous um, in there. And that's really when it kind of sunk in even more, like, wow, this is serious. So I was hospitalized that first time when I was 13. But over the course of a year, I think I was hospitalized seven, seven times, seven, eight times. You know, leaving her in a hospital, a psychiatric hospital, I mean, this is just, you know, this was not our life. This was not our daughter. We knew our daughter. We knew, I mean, you know, a few months before she had been sort of, a, you know, a little depressed, melancholy, but this was a far leap from that. And once in the hospital there, they added an antipsychotic because she was now experiencing psychotic behaviors. In addition, they had to prescribe another medication to take care of the known side effects of the antipsychotic. We didn't really know what else to do when we were in the system. We wanted to trust the experts. Um, so, you know, we went that route. The more medications they added, I got side effects and then they would add medication to cure the side effects. And on and on it went, and I think at one point I was on six or seven at one time. I could not reach her. She was in some other place, and that was probably the scariest moment for us. Yeah, she wouldn't respond if we talked to her. She was clearly in another world. We kept thinking, have we lost her? You know, have we lost our daughter? And I mean, for a while we're like, she's just gonna be in our basement for the rest of her life. My mind was just filled with horrible thoughts like about me and about how horrible I was and how much I hated myself. I mean, what is even the point of me being here anymore? Many, many people are getting an antidepressant, an antipsychotic, a benzodiazepine, and a sleep medicine without any rhyme or reason. And instead of the beneficial effects of these different medicines adding up to something wonderful, very often their harmful effects add up to something terrible. When I got out of the army and went to the VA system, it was like a whole nother ball game. It turned into like cocktails of antipsychotic, antidepressant, benzo. I would say to the clinician like, um, I don't have good feelings. All I just feel is numb or anxious or depressed. I don't ever feel happy or grateful or like loving, and then, oh, we, we'll just add another medicine. Maybe that one's not working. So then we'll switch to a different one. So basically my medication history is just a succession of, oh, this doesn't work. Let's go all the way up to the highest dose and see what happens. Okay, it didn't work. Okay, come back down. Okay, that didn't work, so let's switch it and try another one. It's like a hamster wheel that I never got off of until now. What happens to someone like Angie is that when they get on these medications and they begin to, to, to deteriorate, the attribution is to their mental condition as opposed to, to the medication. And so when they go in and they say, um, well, you gave me an antidepressant and now I'm really depressed, then they say, well, I see your depression is worsening. Um, and so they up it or add a medication. Next thing you're on, they're on uppers and downers. And I mean, you just see this pattern. And every time they go in, it's their deteriorating mental condition. Um, instead of somebody saying, your drug may be your problem. Hi. Hi. Nice to see you. you. Nice you to too. meet you. you Thank you for coming. It's awesome to be here. I'm so nervous because I can't talk like this at my own school. <laughs> so um, I want to just like run through my story quickly and then just talk because I'm sure you have like really cool questions. I was on a cocktail of 17 medications at once. 
And then basically from 2006 to 2016, it took me all that time to like get off of everything else. So every time you went in and you were prescribed some of these medications, what were you told about the side effects? How much information were you given before you were prescribed this medication? In the office, you have 10 minutes with the psychiatrist, that's it. So then they're like, so how are you feeling today? And then you're like, um, well, I'm still really anxious and I didn't sleep last week. And, and then they're like, well, I want you to take this little quiz. You know, do you feel um, jumpy in public? You know, do you spend time with friends? Like, it was just one of those psychological assessments, right? So I'm just filling out the little test and then he takes the test and then I see him pull out the DSM and then he's like, oh, yep, you have generalized anxiety disorder. And I'm like, what is another label gonna do for me now? Like, really? Another label, thank you. Now I have addict, PTSD, generalized anxiety, panic disorder with agoraphobia, major depression. Like, for what? What does any of those labels do for me? Nothing. I'm doing everything that you tell me to do, and I'm not getting better. So the most hurtful part of all of this that I want you to listen to is that I did all the therapy. I saw social workers, therapists, psychiatrists, psychologists. Not once did somebody say, it could be your meds. Not once in 13 years. That is what hurts me the most. And um, now I'm in social work school. I have all A's. My brain is coming back. <laughs> I can write a mean APA paper. <laughs> yeah. You were talking about you know, a lot of these meds that are being prescribed for four to six years should only be taken for a few weeks. Do you think there's ever a place for medications or would you ever hold someone's hand through that decision process? At the beginning, I was like anti-med, like no way. Hell no, because I'm lucky that I didn't kill myself or someone else. So like, how can I like say, oh, go ahead, take those meds, you know? And like, there is times when some people, and when I say some, I mean like very few. So I'm not anti-med, I'm pro-informed consent. So if you as a social worker want to talk to them about informed consent, that is like well within our boundaries. We get it for a surgery, why aren't we getting it for meds? You shared that you're very uncomfortable with all the labels you've been given. If you could change that label to something, what would you? I just think I was in, like, I was just scared. Like, I was just a scared little girl that was 24, and, like, it didn't have to be so complicated, yeah. you know? So I was first diagnosed with ADHD when I was 15, I think. I remember it being a relief to get the diagnosis. Oh my gosh, okay, that's, that's why everything's so hard. It's not that I'm stupid, it's not that I'm lazy. It's, I was pretty severely depressed. I mean, I couldn't go to school. I just cried all the time and yeah, it's kind of a mess. Um, at that point then I was put on uh, Dexedrine I felt a ton better and was able to go to school on a regular basis. I felt some hope again. I hear anecdotes that vary. Anecdotes of the great effects of drugs, and I would say that's about 20, 25% of, of anecdotes I hear. This has really been great for me. This has helped me through a very difficult time. About 40% saying it may have helped some. It's hard to tell what exactly it was doing. I can't say it hurt me, can't say it helped me. I seem kind of indifferent to what it may have done. And then I get the other 30% or 35% saying, this hurt me, this damaged me. That's the anecdotes I've been hearing. And I think that details a little bit what you find in the literature out there. You know, when they come to see a doctor, they want that pill that they hope will take care of their problem thoroughly and rapidly. And most of these medications will actually do that very well in the short term. So that's, that's the other thing that's so hard about it. In the short term, they really work. The reason that I kind of changed the way I practice was the realization that I was actually harming my patients. It is very clear that there is a cohort of patients for whom getting off of these drugs is exquisitely painful. When Dave decided to go off the meds, I think he probably didn't share it with me because he knew that they, they worked for me and they were successful for me, um, but that wasn't the case for him. She knew something was, was 
different. She knew something was wrong. I was having a lot of irritability, a lot of difficulty communicating, so it put a lot of stress on our relationship, and we just didn't talk about it much, you know? I thought I was the worst wife in the world, and um, I didn't know what was going on, and every day driving home, I was like, okay, what, you know, what can I do differently? Um, and about, I'd say, four weeks later, he shared with me that um, he had taken himself off the medication. Um, and that was a huge relief to me to go, okay, it's not me. But um, yeah, he was, he just he became short and irritable and he wasn't positive anymore. Everything was uh, negative. I was totally dysfunctional and began experiencing this, what I'll call this irrational terror-like level of anxiety that it, I had never previously experienced. I'd come home from work and I found him uh, on the kitchen floor, uh, curled up in a ball, um, just sobbing and rocking. Didn't want anybody to be, touch him, be anywhere near him. Um, he'd go, he would find a place to go hide in the house and just um, sob uncontrollably. It was really, really hard to see. I got to a point where I wholesale refused to consume any more drugs, and that kind of came to a head several months ago. Um, and that's why right now we're separated. The breaking point for me deciding to move out, there was there was a couple of things. He is of the mindset that it's just gonna take time and there's nothing that you can do. And I said, you know, here's what the options that I see. They're mostly uh, medical-based and he's absolutely refused. I explained my entire background to my psychiatrist. I said, I look, I took pride in being in the Navy. I took pride in, in surviving and making it through MIT and had high hopes to, to do good things uh, for the Navy and for the country. And, and now I don't know who I am. And the only thing that's happened between then and now is I've been exposed to a series of very strong psychiatric medications. And the answer after 20 minutes was, well, I can give you a prescription for Cymbalta. When I did move out, um, he called me and said that he was standing in the basement next to a noose. And I said, and what's your safety plan? Um, and he said to call you. And I said, that's not a safety plan. You need to hang up and call 911. Um, and he having to tell him that, um, it feels callous to me. When you're going through withdrawal psychiatric drugs, the best thing is to kind of get back off that ledge and just say, Dave, just give, your, give yourself more time. Give yourself more time. Continue to fight for it. Um, you know, and someday, you know, you'll regain a sense of normalcy in your day-to-day -day life. When it comes to medication discontinuation, there's a silent epidemic of people struggling with this. We have a cultural understanding that illicit substances can be addictive. We understand this with nicotine and with alcohol, with heroin, cocaine. But for whatever reason, we don't think of psychiatric medications as addictive. Taking that first pill, um, it's not free. It comes with the potential for physiologic dependence. People are jumping out of their skin, feeling terrific anxiety, having all sorts of physiological symptoms that are difficult to bear. People cannot stop this medicine except in the slowest possible way with very gradual reductions in dose. So this is how I cut my pills. So I'm doing here a 10% taper. So I'll take the pill. I weigh it, so a whole pill at two milligram weighs 0 0.15, 90, 10% of that. You don't want to take off too much because you're going to waste the pills. So it's almost there actually, that's 10%, yeah. The first time I tapered, I didn't have my scale as yet, so I was just eyeballing because I was determined to get off. Well, your body will tell you if you're handling the cuts based on symptoms. So it took me a while to get from 2 to 1.6. It was 1.64. That's all I could go. 
So this group has um, almost 2,300 members. And people just post stuff. How's everyone doing today? Let's see. I'm in a strange window today. Up dose for almost two days. Up dose is when you're at a certain dose and the symptoms get really bad, so you go back to the original dose where you weren't feeling so bad. Everyone has a unique stuff running through you. No two persons are alike. I had brain zap, I had tremors, I had severe night sweats. I have a symptom where it feels like things are crawling inside my body, just, just moving. And I came across this image and I was like, wow, that's exactly how, that's exactly how it is. I found this image also. This picture says exactly how it feels inside my head when I say I have these burning sensations that are just all over my spine and my body. The image is so truthful because I don't feel anything here. Right here is very normal. It's just here, it's just everything here. That's exactly how it is. I found that support group just by chance. I typed in lorazepam <laughs> and lorazepam withdrawal, lorazepam dangers, all these, I'm like, what? And that's when I started reading. I said, I have to join a support group. Nobody understands this. And if you don't have support, you will lose yourself. I've been a part of these groups since August of last year. And since August of last year, we lost three people to suicide in my support groups. Three. We lost a 50-something-year-old woman whose doctor cold turkeyed her off of clonopin. And she suffered. And she has two little boys. And she walked in front of a train because she couldn't deal with it anymore. About a month ago, we lost a 40-something-year-old guy. He shot himself in the head. Blew his, blew his head off. So we're losing people in this fight. I think about it all the time. What if my symptoms get to the point where I can't make it? What am I going to do? I finally got off all the drugs. All the intrusive thoughts stopped. The suicidal thoughts stopped. I had to see my psychiatrist for the last time on Friday. And there was like a sense of closure for me. Probably two months left and then I graduate with my bachelor's. And then the grad program starts in the fall and I'll be on my way. Uh, we're pretty close to the entrance. I'm Angie. Nice I'm to meet you. Dr. Featon's daughter. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, I see. You're gonna be in the in the house. Which one's the house? The one with the porch. Okay, perfect. Cool. That's pretty cool. I haven't seen that name in a long time. Welcome. Hi. You're welcome. Hi. How are you? Hi. Good. Hi. Good. Hi. Good. Hi. Good. Hi. It's good to see you. Hello. Oh my God. It's great to see you. Come on in. Just put your gear on the deck. No rain. We should be good. Inevitably, the war fighters that I work with are drugged and they all come back impacted. The trauma is pretty much across the board. So I'm gonna give you um, Dr. Featon's version of the suicide lecture. That black box warning that is on your psychiatric medications, the Prozac, the Zoloft, the Abilify, that's not on there to lower the drug company's liability. It's on there because the overwhelming scientific evidence indicates that they are a danger and that they cause people to commit suicide. They cause people to do things that are disinhibited, engage in behaviors that they would never engage in at other times. Can I say something about suicide? Yes. I've never been suicidal in my entire life, and, except for medications. 
The first time was Clonopin, the second time was Lyrica, and this time was Ativan. There's like a space in there. Okay, I'm having suicidal thoughts. Okay, that's all right, but I'm not gonna do it. But then that space disappears. It's like something else takes over your body because of those drugs and like you just do it. So if you struggle with those thoughts, like you have to talk to somebody about them. You can't just like, oh, I'm, I'm better than this, I'm strong. You have no idea how that, those drugs can like turn on you in a second and you will die from it. I don't know if you guys got the same brief I did, but when we went overseas, you know, you get the brief of don't get captured. If you get captured, they're gonna cut your head off on national television and show your parents and all this and that. So they, without saying it, they tell you, save a bullet for yourself. When you cross that line and actually believe that, I think it's really hard to come back over because it's, I mean, it's been hard for me. Um, so it's trazodone for sleep, lamitrigine for mood stabilizer, risperidone is antipsychotic, boost bar is an anti-anxiety, haldol is an antipsychotic, and I'm taking a benzo with it to keep from getting ticks. Um, Valium, the Invega injection that I get once a month, and then clonazepam three times a day, and then as needed. Is that two milligrams that. three times a day? Yeah. That is an extremely high dose. This is all from the same doctor? Yes. She's on two benzos, in addition to three antipsychotics and an injection. I, I should be a happy... <laughs> that, uh... <laughs> Go lucky zombie. That's amazing that your respiratory system is... Still working? Functioning, yeah. yeah. What's really scaring me is once I'm off this medicine, what am I going to do? Because for the better part of 15 years, I've been on medicine. And no one's told me anything different. So this, what I'm hearing here this week, it's like almost a brand new life for me. The main thing for me is hearing what other veterans are saying, and it's the same thing that I'm going through. What, like, which things? Are well, like, number one, why do I want to kill myself? I can't figure this out. I have two beautiful kids, so why do I want to kill myself? There's no logical answer. Were you ever suicidal before the meds? No. It is a long journey getting off of them, and you will experience some very, very unpleasant symptoms. And, and one of them for me was this extreme levels of irritability. And it, it destroyed my relationship with my wife, and we you know, became separated over it. How did I get from, I was up on this mountain, climbing my way up, to locked in a psych ward, banging my head against the wall, Right? How did I get to this point? I feel like I was asking for help. Like, yeah. hi, my soldier just got hit. Exactly. I don't know how to handle that. Yeah. And their answer was, here's some drugs. Yeah. But it's like, I just needed you to tell me, thank God he's alive. Or this is going to take some time to grieve this. Yeah. Or you're going to feel guilty for a little while because you weren't there. Or something like that. Exactly. But no, pills. it was like, shut, sh don't worry about your feelings. Here's pills. If I had just taken a couple weeks off of school you and recalibrated. Life would have been totally different. I would have been totally fine. My whole life would have continued on. Yeah, you know, I look back, I, you know, I've tried every effects here, some Balta, so like, I mean, I've been yeah, through all of the them, list. right? Yes. The list of them. And it's, it's just this kind of like archaic trial and error that only, I, only an alchemist, right? Someone who thinks they can make gold out of nothing would, would attempt. Like all those years, I, I would say like, I don't have relationships, I don't have friends, I don't go out, I don't care about anything. And they would say it was me. And so now I'm like, it was not me. Yeah. It was their fucking drugs. The F-bomb aficionado yeah. is presented to Sergeant Angie Peacock for repetitive use of the F-bomb in keeping with the highest traditions of the Marine Corps <laughs> in the United States Naval Service. Oh, Can you give us any words of wisdom? Fuck yeah. <laughs> the gorilla in the room is the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, the drug companies spend something like $80 billion a year on marketing and lobbying. They spend much, much less on research and most of the research they do is really a tool of marketing, not developing new products. Let's go back to the start of this disease model in the 1980s, okay? Now, the first drug that was tested in this new era was Xanax, alprazolam, for panic disorder. And here was the study they conducted. They compared Xanax versus a placebo group, and the primary outcome measure was the number of panic attacks on average per week. And after four weeks, Xanax was doing better. Fewer panic attacks. At eight weeks, the Xanax patients were doing no better than placebo. 
And then at the end of 14 weeks, the Xanax patients were doing worse than they were at the beginning and much, much worse than the placebo patients. The trial told of harm done. It told of people who were going to get addicted. When they came off, they'd have all sorts of withdrawal symptoms and some people unable to get off, okay? So that's what the study showed. What did they report? They didn't report the eight-week results. They focused on the four-week results because that was a story that told of an effective new treatment for panic disorder and completely hid the 14-week results. Pretty soon, Xanax became one of the best-selling drugs in the country. It is still prescribed left and right. And what did we have in the early 80s? A story of science that told of harm done. The longer you take a study out, the more likely you are to see people not doing well on that drug, right? Or developing side effects from that drug. So the pharmaceutical industry doesn't favor long-term studies for monetary reasons and for outcome reasons. They, they don't want to show that their drug actually doesn't do well. There's a, as, as much marketing in the tests that are devised to measure the outcomes, in the investigators that are hired to conduct the study, all of that stuff is marketing, but it's presented and manufactured and published as science. So here's how it's done and how it was done. They funneled all sorts of money to what are called thought leaders. Academic psychiatrists at prestigious American universities, Harvard, Stanford, Johns Hopkins, and those academic psychiatrists began working for the drug companies as consultants, serving as their speakers, advisors, etc. You would start with a clinical study of the drug. But who's designing the study? The pharmaceutical companies, they know how to design it to make their drug look good. That's step one. Who then analyzes the data? Well, their own people do it. It's done by the drug companies themselves. Third then, who writes the papers? It's actually ghostwriters hired by the drug companies to write up the study. They now present this study to the people that they want to be the big names of the study. And then those thought leaders basically sign off on the ghost-written papers, and they become, quote, the authors of the published paper. The former editors of the medical journals like JAMA and New England Journal of Medicine and BMJ, British Medical Journal, they've all said that, like, basically, we became vehicles for story laundering. It was a corrupted creation of an evidence base. Now, I'm a practicing doctor in some town, what am I going to believe? Well, I'm going to believe, you know, Mr. Dr. Bigwig at Harvard University that this is the best science. So my obligation is to use the very drug they say is so great. So for example, Prozac. Prozac didn't really work in the trials. Prozac had all sorts of adverse effects. And those of us who are old enough to remember when Prozac came to market, it was, the drug itself was on the cover of magazines. Our powers are such now that we can give you whatever personality you want. That's how great our knowledge is advancing. That was the story told. What did science tell us? Did you know what they found? In the 1970s, very first studies done in Germany. What do they see? All sorts of psychotic events, worsening of depression, homicidal, suicidal impulses, so much that the German authorities said, this is a dangerous drug. We're not going to approve it. And now go read the, the studies that were reported by the Americans. The psychosis is gone. The homicidal problems are gone. Imagine you're a mother, and I know mothers, who said to their kid who got depressed over breaking up with a, a girl or something like that. The doctor says, oh, Prozac doesn't increase suicide risk. And then a week later, that kid hangs himself. That's in a real case. Can you think of any worse corruption of that? It has been shown that half of the deaths that occur in psychiatric drug trials, they're never published. They disappear. You have an expression in America, torture your data until they confess. And this happens all the time. The difference between an honest data analysis and one you have manipulated can be worth billions on the world market. So what do you think they'll do?
Uh-huh. Oh, Margaret's not the crap. You want to start on this side? I'm still nowhere near the person that was, but this is how I explain it to my wife. Like, I know I love her. I know I can remember, I can recall the feelings and the sensations of when we met, when we dated, when we got married. Um, but I don't feel love. I don't feel love for her. I don't feel love for my dog. I don't feel love or connection. I mean, it's almost like I don't feel for other people's concerns or feelings or emotions. Um, and I think that's multifaceted. I think it's partly the drugs. I think it's partly brought on by the severe trauma of going through the experience. I don't know. But my family hasn't necessarily understood why I've chosen to come back and stay in an abusive relationship. Why do they define it as abusive? Um, I mean, I've said some hurtful things. Yes, and when you were in the absolute depths of it, you were abusive. In what way? Verbally abusive? Yes. Okay. Not physically abusive? Not physically, no, but verbally abusive. I can recall telling you, you just got to give me time. <laughs> I'm so mad at you. Why were you so mad? Well, because we had given it time and it wasn't getting really any better. And I didn't feel like that treatment plan was necessarily working. I um, mean, you said some pretty horrible things. And it happened so quickly after we got married, I felt like it was like a bait and switch kind of deal. So what do you think about you trying to get off of Vivance this summer? I would like to try. Yeah? I think it's gonna be hard. Honestly, what I'm most scared about, honey, is that I haven't heard, I'm here to support you through this, mm -hmm. regardless of what happens. And that's, are you listening? I am. Okay. It doesn't feel like it. Mm -hmm. Thank I'm you. Listening. I have been through hell with you and have held you while you've banged your head against the wall. And this is my fear coming from the things that were said when you were in your depths and that's it. You're going to say, well, maybe this isn't the right relationship for us. Yeah, I hear you. And I've put so much into it. Yeah. There really is no research on the long-term impact of stimulant use, but the longer you're on them, the higher the dose, the, the more risks that you incur over time and the less actual benefit you get from that drug. Hello. Hi, how are you? Good. Good. So, um, how's your focus been doing? Not as hot as I would like it. Um, it's, I kind of feel like I've reached the tolerance. Um, how long overall has it been that you've been on stimulants in total? 15 years at okay. least. Okay. Your dosage is as high as I've ever seen for myself, but if, if it's just not great, uh, then normally we would try Adderall. Okay. And, and I'm actually interested in decreasing and getting off. Right, yeah. I well, I mean, you always can. Uh, mm -hmm. If I were you myself, I wouldn't just abruptly stop. Well, I'd, no, I'm not interested yeah. in abruptly stopping. Uh, That's what right. my husband did, and that was not pretty. Right. You could actually open the capsule and gradually, day after day, just take out a little bit more. Okay, what, at what rate? You could kind of judge. You, you could uh, maybe drop a third of the amount out, one okay. of them wait for a few days, take the third out of the other one, you know, and just kind of wean off. If on the other hand, you said, definitely it's better to be on the medicine, but it's still not great, uh, then I would recommend trying Adderall, just because it's got a little bit higher potency. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate your Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Anything else? I think that's it. Oh, All right. Thank you very You're much. Very welcome. I appreciate You're it. Welcome. Doing it for Dave, he wasn't in the picture, then I probably wouldn't be doing this. Oh look, there's Dave. <laughs> Hi, honey. How'd it go? It went good. Okay. And he recommended if the Vivance isn't meeting what I need that I should move to Adderall. 
So, of course. <laughs> yeah, so I think that's what I'm going to do. I... You're joking, right? <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> So I'm gonna take the medicine out of the capsule. 60 milligram capsule, put six ounces of water in and dissolve it in that and then drink, I guess, five ounces. I guess it's the start of a journey and see what happens there. Ah, uh, Brooklyn. Well, we're gonna see um, the doctor. We're gonna see that doctor that put me on these drugs. There's a hidden camera right here. And I got some wires underneath all this. Well, this is it. There's the office right there. What do you know about benzo? Listen, unfortunately, a lot of people take benzo these days is they don't want to come off, come off, but... They can't come off. No, no, they can. It's just a lot of people cannot work up that determination. It's not about benzo, it's about your determination. That's how people stop smoking. That's how people stop heroin, coke, whatever. I've seen this all the time. It's never chemical. It's never chemical that controls you. You're Why do you think it's so hard to get people off benzos? Because it's a fault. They don't want to go through any little pain, discomfort, and suffering. Yeah, but do you know the kind of pain and discomfort? When you hear that crap that you cannot get off benzos, total crap. They pain lip service. I don't think most people meet when they say, I can't get off benzos. I think most people mean, I didn't know it was going to be this difficult. They thought it was probably being easier I, to stop. I always tell people, it's never a free ride. It's not a free ride. You didn't tell me that. You said you can stop anytime you want. There'll yes, be no problem to you stop. You can stop. Oh, yes, but that's not the impression that you gave. I didn't know I was going to have withdrawal symptoms. If you had told me, by the way, this drug can give you withdrawal symptoms, so do you still want this drug? Then I would have made my own decision. I based my decision in taking this drug because of you, because of the trust that I had in you. If I was given the clear picture as to what the profile of this drug was, I would have said no freaking way. He's following the script. He said, I went to medical school and I'm a board certified uh, psychiatrist and I follow everything that they say to diagnose people. So basically he doesn't believe that he's doing anything wrong. Informed consent, I think, is so important here because the typical encounter might look like someone going into their primary care doctor's office and reporting symptoms of depression. And they might walk out of there with a prescription for an antidepressant after maybe an eight minute conversation. That's not enough time barely to cover potential side effects, let alone um, the true story around efficacy or um, alternatives to antidepressants. To me, when I'm talking about this choice of how should we manage your depression, um, that's the least I can do is let someone know um, this is a valid option, but you deserve to know what you might be getting yourself into. That's just concerning to me. That it's seems a like a drugs. lot of medication. Yeah. If your only question was, do you have something that can help me sleep? Yeah. Ultimately, you did stop taking these medications, yeah. right? Did you have any of these withdrawal symptoms? Did you experience anything like that? I had about like 10,000 withdrawal symptoms. Okay, so talk to so 10,000. So 10,000 is a lot. lot right? I had a lot of withdrawal symptoms. That seems like a lot to me. But right. I had a but myriad of that. withdrawal symptoms. All right, let's talk about those. So no one said hey, these are the risks associated with stopping this medication. No, I thought it was a safe drug. When I found out that it wasn't a safe drug, I almost blew a lid. Right. You know, um, 
there have been thousands, if not tens of thousands of lawsuits against various manufacturers. And these drug companies, despite the lawsuits, they've been investigated by various attorneys general. They've paid fines to various regulatory bodies. They continued to promote their drugs and sell as much of the drug as they possibly could before the patent expired. And then it goes generic. That's a problem. We cannot sue any manufacturer of a generic drug, regardless of the risks. And even worse than that, let's say there's a responsible CEO of a generic manufacturer. And he said, I'd really like to put a warning on this medication, whatever, medication X, because I really believe, based on the information I've seen, that it's associated with the risk of, let's call it suicide in your case. He's not even allowed to change the drug label for the drug that he manufactures. Really? And that's what Congress says. Oh and that's my. a big problem. So unfortunately, what we see is this. I'm not sure that we're going to be able to make a recovery for you. In fact, my suspicion is no. If it's generic now, I think it is generic now. Right. What I'm telling you is, unfortunately, you can't hold them so accountable. Who, so who, who then do we is. hold accountable? We can't hold anyone accountable right so now. So everyone it's, just, it, yes, people die and your lives are damaged yes. and that's it? Mm -hmm. That's just awful. It is awful. We go into this field because we want to help people, but it's very difficult to know where to turn for unbiased evidence on these issues. The pharmaceutical industry has tremendous influence over uh, what doctors learn, how they learn it. So general lack of knowledge about the dangers of these drugs is one of the main reasons that doctors continue to prescribe uh, even when they're inadvertently causing their patients harm. I asked, you know, right before she went on medication, she was just fine. She was a little, little depressed, but she was not having psychotic episodes. She was not having body tics. She was not hallucinating. Do you think that the medication is actually the cause of this? It was as if uh, I was asking the most irrelevant question in the world. I never got a really response. It was, it was just not worthy of their attention. The more that we were talking about, this is who Rebecca is. We know our daughter. We know this medication has turned her into someone else. We said, you know, we don't think she should be on medication, and here's why. And we read off the list of symptoms. He basically said, you know, I think this is a, this is a really bad decision, a, a huge mistake. It was a reminder of a year in which, by and large, whenever we went down this path of, is medication harmful? We got no support from the, the psychiatrist that we saw. None. If it's not medication, then you're not doing it right. But we stuck to our guns. And this sounds very dramatic, but I feel that decision saved our daughter's life. I kept thinking when she was first telling us that she was feeling depressed that I wouldn't even have had the vocabulary to say that when I was her age. So that just tells you a little bit about how pervasive this has become in our society. I see children who are acting out or um, feeling distressed they are like the canaries in the coal mine, you know, that are basically shouting out, like, there is something wrong. But, you know, we, we quiet them. I got out of the hospital. They took me off medication. Within a few months, I was, I was back to normal. Not normal, but I was, my hallucinations were completely gone, and what was left was the issues to begin with, the anxiety and the eating disorder. And then we could move to focus on those because those were the problems. College was something that I never thought that I would do during that year and even afterwards. I was like, there's no way I can go to college. I can't handle that. But here I am handling it. <laughs> and it's paradise for someone who loves school as much as I do. So I'm just kind of being a normal college student and having fun because that's what I can actually do now. So why did you do this for me? I was just as concerned 
as you were about coming off the drugs and I wanted to make sure that you were in charge, right? You did what you felt was best, but you also had the tools laid out for you. The best way is essentially an exponential taper, and that's what we plotted out here. And what that leads to is this nice, slow um, decline over an extended period of time. Do you think it was of any value? Well, yeah, because when I did it myself, I went down too quickly and it felt horrible. And this gave me a clear plan with specific dates and numbers. So it was very helpful. Math can be love. <laughs> uh, I see glimmers of the old Dave much more often than um, I have in several years. Um, it's not, he's not there all the time, but um, I, I want to come home now, whereas before it was, okay, you know, take a couple deep breaths and come home. Um, but now I want to come home, which is, it's a good feeling. Um, it's nice to feel that again. He got killed in action a month to the day after I was medevaced out. So now I'm processing this grief 13 years later, which most people would say, you should be over it by now. But you know, I, I just had to call my, one of my soldiers and be like, can you tell me the story again? Because the last time I heard it, I was on drugs and I didn't feel it. So I, now I need to sit by him and think like, look what this war did to us and feel it. Thank you.